In most fantasy movies, the heroes find themselves on some sort of quest. Usually it's to deliver their realm from the powers of darkness. The travelers know the end goal, but aren't always sure about how they'll get there. And they certainly don't know all of the twists and turns that they're going to encounter along the way. But knowing that they must go, they hit the road anyway, covering as much ground as they can between each new obstacle. In the 1988 classic Willow, before the team leaves the comforts of home on their adventure, they meet with the local sorcerer, hoping to get some divine guidance through his divination. He declares, I will consult the bones. And he shakes up his little talisman thing there and spills out a bunch of little bones. They're supposed to be magic. They should tell them what to do. But quietly, the sorcerer turns to Willow and says, the bones tell me nothing. But their quest has to continue, right? They don't wait. They just keep moving. There's work to be done, lives to save, movie tickets to sell, most of all. And so, so they proceed. From reading God's book, the Bible, we know that the Christian life that we're living is a journey, right? It is a quest that we're on. It's part not only of a uh, individual quest as we grow to become more like Jesus as he conforms us and as we develop in our faith, but it's part of a global rescue mission to deliver people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life. We don't have to move blindly about as we go. We're given constant support in the forms of Scripture and the indwelling Holy Spirit, the example of all of those who have gone before us, assistance from our spiritual family that we're connected to. But that doesn't mean that we're able to anticipate every leg of the trip, each turn ahead, or what roadblocks we might face. In fact, often we find ourselves wondering, what is God up to? sort of scratching our head. What's going on, Lord? Whether it's in our own life or in the wider world, I think if we're honest, we come to those situations uh, pretty frequently. Sometimes we might wonder if God is directing us at all. Are we making progress? Am I making the right decisions in my life, in my spiritual life, in my service to the Lord, in my service to my family? Though so much has been supplied for us and is continually supplied for us, the way ahead is not always clear. That's to be expected because this is a life of faith after all. We can take comfort from a passage like the one before us this evening where even an apostle, the great apostle, Paul, he finds himself not sure of what God is going to do next or of what God wants him to do next, and yet he proceeds forward as a faithful servant. Along the way, we're also going to get a front row seat to providence. Now, providence is a very important, very special thing that God does. It is the way that God brings about his specific desires for the earth and for the people in it. You know, God has a lot of desires, a lot of plans, a lot of intentions, a lot of things that he wants to get done, that he is going to get done through human history. Not just in the broad strokes of human history, raising up kingdoms and bringing down kingdoms, that's part of it, but in the fine strokes of your life, God is working out his providence, those things that he desires, those intentions that he has, that will that he has for your life, he is going to accomplish. And in this set of verses, we see glimpses of God's power and peculiarity when it comes to his providence, as he accomplishes what he wants when he wants it done. Tonight, in one of these displays of God's providential dealings, we find that the things he wants are often not the things we would think of left on our own, which is why, as Christians, we must continue forward and commit to continue forward on this quest of faith, making ourselves available to God's maneuvering, but to commit to being led by the Holy Spirit in the spiritual work we set out on. So we want to have a baseline attitude as Christians or as a church uh, of saying we are committed to making progress in our walk with the Lord and in our work for the Lord, but also commit to being led by the Spirit before we move forward. We're going to begin in verse 6 with Paul, Silas, and Timothy heading west from Syria through Gentile territory. It says, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Paul tried to go south. God said no. So then he pivoted, tried to go north. God said no again. What an amazing thing to read if we just step back for a moment and and really 
take a minute to chew on what we read here. God, we want to preach the gospel of Jesus in Asia or Bithynia. And the Lord said, no, you are forbidden. You are not allowed to do that. Why would God block someone from doing such a good thing? We love traits in our culture, traits like entrepreneurship, innovation, initiative. When people are getting hired, they want, you know, are you a self-starter? Can you get things done on your own? We like that kind of uh, mentality. We like that, those kinds of characteristics. And sometimes in the Christian life, those sort of cultural ideas kind of bleed into the way we want to do things in our service to the Lord. We tend to think, as long as my motivation is good and my plan is a godly goal, then I should do this thing that I want to do. As long as I, I, I want to do it and it's a good thing, let's do it. I've got a passion for this specific kind of ministry, and therefore I should go out and do it. But Acts 16 boldly counters that idea and instead shows us that there are some good things, some godly things that God does not want you to do, or at least does not want you to do right now. That doesn't mean they aren't worth doing. It doesn't mean that God doesn't maybe want someone else to be busy doing them. But for your life, we have to understand that God has a particular timing in a particular set of tasks that have been prepared beforehand for you to walk in. Not only so that you can grow in your relationship with your Savior, but also so that you can bring him great glory and so that he can work great things through your life. As he maneuvers you, as he positions you, as he brings you, you know, from spot to spot, time to time, putting you exactly where he wants you so that you can serve him in a glorious way. It is his plan that we're putting into motion in the Christian life. It's not our plan, right? And so while the Lord gives us a lot of freedom and he is a God of grace and he is a God of many gifts and he is a God who, who just loves to uh, 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 treat us like a father treats his children, it's God's plan. When, when it comes to me serving the Lord or my idea for how to glorify God out there, it's his plan, it's his will, it's his intentions, it's not mine. We talk about this sometimes, you know, sometimes the Bible uses the image of an ambassador, that you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And if we think about the role of an ambassador, the idea is, ideally, if you're an ambassador for a government you are no longer an individual, right? When you show up to that diplomatic meeting, you're no longer the individual with your own ideas and your own plans and your own whatever. That's gonna be a real problem, right? Well, you know, the Congress and the president said this, but I think this would be a great idea. That's called an international incident. That's how wars get started, right? So we have this understanding that, well, yeah, an ambassador is called in that, into that position. No one shows up and says, I, I'm, I'm going to be an ambassador today. They're called in that position by an executive, right? And then they represent the will and the desire and the character of that person that they're representing. It's not their ideas. It's not their plans. It's not their scheme. They're there to deliver the intentions and the message of the person they're representing. And so we just need to be reminded lots of times that it is God's plan and that he has a specific plan, not only for the world, but for your life. Because when God's people are out of sync with what he wants, the result is never good, even when they have good intentions. And this isn't something that's just specific to Paul. This isn't just a one-off B-side that we're reading here in Acts 16. Here's another example. We remember how David had it in his heart to build a permanent house for the Lord. I'm going to build a temple. What a great idea. And even though all the other believers around him thought also it was a great idea, yeah, let's do it. The Lord didn't think it was a great idea. He said, no, absolutely not. I forbid it. You're not allowed to do that. That's not your job to do. It's going to be someone else's job to do. So Paul is out on this trip, and Paul has a goal in mind, but every time he tries to pivot, he's blocked. We don't know how, but the Holy Spirit said, no, you may not. You can't go that way. You can't go that way. Stop it. 
The fact that God didn't just give Paul a specific leading the way he had to fill up back in chapter eight gives us something to think about. And that's that even apostles, when they were on the earth, even missionaries, writers of scripture, leaders in the church, no matter the caliber of Christian, we all have to walk by faith, right? We're all walking by faith. Lots of different people here. All of us have different background, different tenure with the Lord, how long we've walked with the Lord, the kinds of things he's led us through, right? But we're all called to walk by faith. There is no magical level of enlightenment that unlocks power, uh, understanding the, the way that is sometimes portrayed in movies or in ways that is suggested in religions like Buddhism or Scientology, right? Pay enough, do enough, achieve enough, and you unlock some sort of enlightenment, some sort of special power, some sort of special connection with, you know, whatever they're worshiping. But we see here that one of the most spiritual people to ever live, a writer of scripture, the apostle Paul, he also has to walk by faith day in and day out. He didn't know where to go next. He only knew that the spirit was vetoing his ideas, but you know what? He was obedient enough to allow his ideas to be vetoed. That's a really important aspect of this story. We know that God has a plan. We know he is working it out providentially. We know he has given us a free will and we're able to do things like further God's work or hasten his coming, Peter said, or we're also able through our actions to quench the spirit and tear things down. We know that those things are possible. The Bible reveals them. We also know that God's ways are not our ways. So you put all of this together and what it translates to is that we want to be the kind of people who are regularly stirring up God's gifts in our lives and looking for opportunities to do God's work. And we should be asking God to put burdens on our hearts for specific people or areas of service for the Lord to, to send us out to go and serve him. But in the end, we must be people who are submitted to leading. We sang about it tonight. And I, I, you know, this isn't something that I conferred with Pastor John about. It's just the Holy Spirit kind of driving this point home. If God says go, we're to go. And if he says stay, we're to stay. If he says go, that's great. If he says no, that's great. And the obedience needs to be the same either way. Now, since we know, most of us, the rest of the story here, we can see what God was providentially working out, something very special, a great plan one that has a lot of benefits. But Paul didn't know it. He can't see the rest of the turns and where they're going to lead and what exactly the Lord was doing. In the moment, the Lord just kept saying to him, no, no, no. Some scholars try to suggest that the reason God said no was because, well, you know, he wanted to go into Asia, but if he would first leapfrog and do this stuff in Philippi, then when he got to Asia, then the numbers would be really big because of what God was doing, you know, in Macedonia and Europe and all of that. And man, that's just more human reasoning. That's just more of our way of thinking, of scheming and, and strategizing and trying to catalog things in a human way that, well, obviously God's only goal is a big number of people the way that we measure numbers. But the truth is we cannot predict providence. We can't predict anything in the future if God hasn't revealed to us, right? God has revealed a lot to us in his word about what is coming in the future, but we can't predict the future. And you know what we especially can't predict? How God works out his providence. We can't predict it, but we can participate in it. And that's a wonderfully mysterious thing. And God says, hey, if you will go along with me, if you will obey, if you allow the mind of Christ to be in you, if you will follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, if you will wait on me, if you will seek me, I will involve you in providence, even though it's too marvelous to be predicted, even though my ways are so much higher than your ways. Verse eight says, passing by Mycia, they went down to Troas. So they were coming from the east they can't go north, they can't go south, so they keep going west. And they keep moving west, but now they've run into the ocean, the sea. And the Lord is still keeping them in the dark day after day. And I'm sure with each movement westward, Paul and company felt the way we often feel when making decisions. Well, is this the right way to go? Uh, you know, I wanna serve the Lord, but it seems like I'm not getting a clear direction. What should I do? 
In such a situation, I find it helpful to notice that Paul doesn't give up and head home and say, well, God hasn't given me clear leading. I'm just gonna go home then. I'm just gonna go sit on my couch at home and if God wants me, he can call me. He's still made it his business to be about the Lord's business. Okay, this door is closed. I submit to that. I'll obey the Lord in that. What about this one? That door's closed too. I submit to that. I'll obey that. How can I be about the Lord's business without going through these doors? He keeps inching forward as the Lord allows, and he's willing to wait without complaint. Finally, after after who knows how many days of waiting and wondering, a signal flare is seen in the night sky. Verse nine, during the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. Macedonia was in Greece. Uh, Of course, Paul wasn't unwilling to head to Europe. He'd go anywhere. He'd talk to anybody. It just hadn't been part of his plan. Now, people have all kinds of opinions about why Paul wanted to go where he wanted to go. We don't know. Dr. Luke doesn't tell us. Paul was willing to go wherever. He had it in his heart here at first to go into Asia Minor, then to go up into Bithynia. And the Lord said, no, I want you to go over here toward Europe, toward Greece. So now he's had this dream that seemed to be giving the direction they needed. Verse 10, after he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Recently, I saw a video of a service at a prominent church up in Northern California where some of the leaders, who they tell their people that they are apostles, they said they had a prophetic vision in which they were carrying out a prophetic act and that this prophetic act would be very, very historic. And because of the vision that one of them had received, they decided to carry out that act in front of the church, and that was to bring a replica wizard staff on stage and copy the scene from Fellowship of the Ring where Gandalf stands against the Balrog deep in the mines of Moria and declare, you shall not pass. Now, I find that a little bit strange, and I find it not particularly biblical also as a fan of Tolkien's work, <laughs> they just didn't get things right. They were, they were getting references to the book wrong. And I thought, you know, if this is a prophetic vision, I'm guessing that God has read the book. Uh, that's just me. Now, I bring that up because of this. Paul had a vision and we see, okay, and they responded to the vision, but let's look a little bit closer at what we're seeing here. Let's notice a couple of things about Paul's vision and the response. First of all, though they acted quickly, they have been waiting around for a while after all, we can see that they did discuss and evaluate the content of what Paul had seen. It says, we concluded that God had called us to preach. They didn't conclude we should do something that is sort of controversial and that will make a maybe viral video or that addresses a, you know, a popular concern right now that everyone's talking about in the headlines. And that's this video that I saw online. Their, their prophetic act was to banish the Balrog of racism forever. I don't I don't think they were successful as far as I know. I don't mean to poke fun, but it was kind of a sad thing that I watched, you know, as you, th- as you thought, wait a minute, w- what's even happening here right now? Is anyone evaluating the content of what they're talking about and what they're doing right now? So we see that they concluded, they discussed, they thought about it. Now, secondly, we know they had been carefully waiting on the Lord, listening for direction, seeking his will, asking God what he wanted them to do not trying to find whatever was trendy or culturally popular or something that would make a good video or a good headline. He said, Lord, we want what you want. You tell us what to do. We'll wait around as long as you want us to. Just tell us what you want. They didn't wake up and say, fetch us a newspaper from Troas, the Troas Tribune, find whatever seems to be, you know, on the pulse of the, you know, the Trojans here, And then we will respond to that in a way that, you know, will get people talking. That's not what happened. Now, notice this also. The Macedonian man in the vision said, come over here and help us. And in response, what did they plan to do? They planned to go and preach the gospel to them. The gospel helps in all the most significant ways. 
That's not to say we don't need to be a part of compassion ministries, we do. But there is a primary thing. There is a primary need. If you are a surgeon and someone comes in with a severed artery and a broken toe, I bet you can prioritize which thing needs to be dealt with first, right? And so there are a priority of needs when it comes to a lost person. A person might be in need of food. They might be in need of shelter. They might be in need of all sorts of things. But if they are in need of salvation, that is the most important thing. And we want to always be the kinds of people who say, yes, of course we want to show compassion. Our Lord showed compassion. The apostles showed compassion. Of course we want to be generous. Of course we want to meet your physical needs. But we can never jettison the idea that the eternal need is the most important thing. If we're talking about a person having a full stomach or being lost to hell, we really have to prioritize which one is more important. Now, oftentimes, we can do all of those things simultaneously. We can do compassionate ministry while also delivering the gospel. But what happens so often is is that, well, we want people to feel welcome. We want them to feel warm. We want them to know we love them. And so let's not confront them with the gospel. Let's not confront them with sin. Let's not confront them with the coming wrath of God that they are under right now. Instead, just do the compassion ministry. Just show them how loving we are. Just show them how much we want to help their, you know, their needs that they feel. And then we'll get to the gospel. That happens sometimes in ministries. And the problem is that's dealing with the broken toe while an artery is bleeding out. And here we see the apostles were saying, what, what, was the, what was the thing that they were told to do? Come and help us. And in this text, we're not going to see them establish anything uh, like a soup kitchen. They're not going to build any houses. They're not going to build a hospital. Those are all good things, all things that Christians should be involved in. And it is Christians who do those things. You look at the history of the world, it's Christians who establish those sorts of ministries. It's Christians who build hospitals. It's Christians who go out and help the poor. It's Christians that give of themselves in order to benefit others, by and large, throughout human history. But they said, you know what? The gospel is what helps because it frees you from the weight of your sin. It, the gospel is what's going to wash your mind, wash your heart, transform you from a disgusting pagan into someone who lives for the Lord. And so the gospel helps. The Macedonians, what they needed was salvation. Notice this also, obviously God had a specific work in mind, yet he only gave a general vision. He shows them the region, but not the town, not the person, not the situation that they're going to encounter. The man from Canada said, come help us. Okay, we're talking Ottawa, we talk in Toronto, we're talking up in the tundra, we're gonna work with like, you know, the bears and stuff up there. What are we gonna do? kind of fun. It's true that sometimes God gives us detailed instructions. We do think of Philip back in Acts 8. What did the Spirit tell him? Go down this road and hang out there. And then he told him, now go join that chariot. Talk to that guy. And we thank God for that kind of specific leading as he prompts us in those moments. But often the course of our lives will not have those sorts of spiritual bullet points all laid out. Instead, we're to walk by faith as we do operate in grace. And as we're going, wait for God to guide little by little. That's the normal course. Well, how do I do that? I do that by putting my heart in a position of submission and obedience to God by paying attention and and asking the Lord, hey, give me your kind of eyes, give me your mind so that I can see things above the human plane, right? And see these situations from a heavenly perspective by having the word as a a light to our feet, a lamp to our path, right? There are all these things that are provided for us so that we can navigate these hard to navigate turns of life. Something important happens in verse 10, by the way, Dr. Luke shows up in the story. We immediately made efforts concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel. We don't know much about Luke other than that he was a physician and he was a writer both of this book and the gospel which bears his name. He would be a faithful and longtime companion of Paul. And as a man who was constantly being beaten and afflicted with health issues, I'm sure it was pretty nice to have a doctor on the team. Whether these fellows all knew each other already from Antioch, some think that, you know, they probably knew him already and he was in Troas. We just don't know. But it's clear that God was working out his providence to get these guys together, working together. Because if 
Paul had gone up to Bithynia, down to Asia Minor, there's no meeting with Luke at Troas. And, you know, the partnership between Paul and Luke is one that we still benefit from today. Aren't you thankful they got hooked up together so that he could start cataloging the things that were going on, uh, so that he could be with Paul and uh, minister to him? It doesn't seem like Paul had planned to bring a physician on the road with him, but God, it seems, was thinking, oh, you're going to need a doctor. And I've got one prepared. And he's positioned in Troas, the launching point from where I want you to go. And he's not only going to be able to tend your many wounds, he's also one of the finest historians the world has ever known. And he's a gifted evangelist. Providence is pretty neat. Let's get you to Troas. Let's get you hooked up with this guy. Before setting sail in verse 11, one more thing to consider. It says, we made efforts to set out to Macedonia. They weren't the kind of guys who just let go and let God. They weren't the kind of guys who said, well, I have a vision for ministry and now it's someone else's job to go carry it out. This sometimes happens in the church. These guys put their hands to the plow themselves. And once they felt God's leading, they did what they could individually and together as a group to move forward in it themselves. From Troas, verse 11, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace the next day to Neapolis. The language indicates that the wind was with them, carrying them swiftly from Asia to Europe. In fact, it's going to take them more than twice as long to make this trip on the way back. Okay, the Lord is leading. He showed us the way. We've had a vision. He built up the team. He put a jet booster on our ship and get us across. That makes the arrival in verses 12 and 13 all the more startling. Verse 12, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony, a leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed in the city for several days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. So all this build up and nothing happens. I mean, honestly, nothing happens. What's going on? They get there, there's no synagogue, meaning there weren't even 10 believing Jewish men in the whole city. They hang around for a few days, there's nothing to do. Where's the man from the vision? Where's the work? I thought we were going to strike oil here. And it seems like they just kind of were <laughs> going like this for a few days. And I guess we'll wait till Saturday and go down to the river and see if anybody's living in a van down by the river. <laughs> In Willow, the team goes through a major effort to get to the castle at Tiraslene. If they can just get there, they keep saying, that if we can just get there, everything will be right as rain. The quest will be over. They finally arrive to discover the castle is defeated and deserted. Quite a letdown, and so the quest continues. Paul and the guys finally get to the weekend, and they head out to the river, hoping that some Jews might be meeting there. Now, what must have seemed in the moment like a letdown, we know was God's providence. He had a very particular plan for Philippi, a wonderful plan. And his plan was gonna happen on Saturday. God's plan was gonna happen on Saturday. Maybe they got there on a Tuesday and God said, yeah, my plan's happening on a Saturday. And thank the Lord that that they were willing to wait. Because God's plan for this city wasn't going to happen in a dramatic way in the city square, but through a casual conversation at the riverbank. Language scholars point out that the term used for spoke to the women isn't one you would use for preaching or lecture or an official discourse. It's just a friendly conversation. They just sat down and made, you know, small talk and started up a conversation with these folks. This shows us another aspect of how to participate in Providence And that's that we need to not cling to preconceived ideas of how ministry should go. We wouldn't have predicted that a heavenly vision would connect to such an ordinary interaction. It must be something bigger. It must be something greater. It must be something more impressive. But that was God's plan. Go talk to a couple ladies by the riverbank while you're skipping rocks on Saturday. But if Paul had said, no, 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 we're going to talk to the governor. We're going to talk to some important Romans here. We're going to stay, you know, in this plaza until a bunch of people show up. That's what we're here for. Well, then they would have missed out on God's plan for a specific lady and her family, who we meet in verse 14. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. You got to smile when you see God doing things. He tells Paul he's not allowed to preach in Asia Minor because he wants Paul to go to Greece so he can talk to a woman from Asia Minor. She's from Thyatira, right in the middle of where Paul wanted to go. Yeah, I wanted to go there. 
Yeah, no, you're going to talk to her over here. You're going to talk to her across the ocean. Lydia was from Thyatira, had set up shop, it seems, in Philippi. And looking at her conversion, we can notice a few things. First, look at what God will do in his effort to reach one lost lamb. Of course, others were going to be saved on this visit. We know. We, we've read the rest of the book. We understand that it wasn't just, just this lady. But look at what God will do in order to reach out to, in this situation, one lady who will be on the riverbank that Saturday morning. Look at what he will marshal together, the innumerable elements brought together so that this lady could hear the gospel and have a chance to be saved. And then through her, others. And then through them, others. Let's also notice the process of her conversion. This is important because there are some Christian traditions or systems of theology that say that God's grace is irresistible, that he has predetermined who will be saved and who will not be saved, and that there's nothing you or I or anyone can do about it other than that we are forced one way or the other into salvation or not into salvation. On the other hand, there is the historic heresy of saying that salvation is, is of man's initiative, right? That man somehow goes to God of his own accord and says, well, I realized on my own that I need salvation. Will you save me? And God kind of says, well, let me see what I can do for you. Okay, both of those things are not what the Bible teaches and both of those things are incorrect. What do we see here? We see a biblical process of salvation. You have a woman, Lydia, a hell-doomed sinner, we don't know her whole story, but at some point, she recognized that God must exist, whether through the testimony of creation or exposure to the Old Testament. However it was, she responded to what little light she was given, whatever revelation she had, and she became what is called a God-fearer, a Gentile who followed the God of Israel. Now, God in his providence orchestrated uh, an innumerable series of events so that he could get a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ in front of her. And then through what we call prevenient grace, God opened her heart, meaning he freed her will so that once she heard this gospel, she was able to respond to it one way or another. Notice God did not outfit her heart with belief. God didn't put belief in her heart. He opened her heart so that she was able to respond. You see, the work of salvation is all God's. It's his initiative. It's not our initiative. But God does not force his grace on anyone. He invites us, right? He has given the invitation to the whole world. And then he frees our will as individuals so that we are then free to choose yes or no. And in this case, Lydia made the choice to believe on Jesus Christ and she was saved. She accepted the invitation and therefore received the free gift of salvation. What if she had chosen otherwise? Well, we'll see examples of that later in Acts. People like Felix, who had the same kinds of invitations, the same kinds of conversations with Paul. And we see that they had that same draw towards the Lord as the Lord Jesus was knocking on the doors of their heart day after day after day. But they chose to shut him out. Don't open. Don't let him in. Don't respond. Let me just don't stop talking. I'll come back at a more convenient time. And so we see these choices playing out on the pages of Scripture. God is so gracious that he gives us a genuinely free will to choose. And he is so powerful that he can accomplish his will even when people refuse him. When his servants are in line with what he wants, when we are submitted to him and committed to being led and to making progress, then we see these wonderful things happening where the right person is at the right place at the right time for an eternal difference to be made. Verse 15. After she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Lydia is a great sales lady, and we see she had a heart for hospitality. In her case, she wasn't directed by God to leave her business or renounce her work. Instead, she'd serve the church and other Christians with what God had given her. From what we can tell, she would continue as a seller of purple. Matthew Henry once wrote, religion does not call us from our business in the world, but directs us in it. And now she too is part of the active providence of God. Now, because people were committed to doing God's work, but were also willing to be led in what he wanted rather than what they wanted, you not only had a small team of missionaries moving around in the city, you also had a permanent home base there in Philippi. We could not have strategized this. The end goal for our planning meeting would not have been, let's go to a city 
And at the end of the day, all we'll have is a couple ladies by the side of the riverbank. We would not have planned it. We would not have strategized it. We would not have thought it a, a good use of Paul's time and Silas's time and all of these other people. We could not have predicted what God wanted Paul to do. Luckily, when it comes to living out the Christian life and being a part of providence, we don't have to predict it. Instead, we just participate by being led by God, the Holy Spirit, allowing him to have his way, choosing to be obedient as he leads us, understanding that he plans to lead us, that we need to be actively pursuing God, drawing near to God, kind of knocking on the doors of opportunity to serve him and then make ourselves available for his grand and gracious purposes. Whatever he wants is what we want. 